Well, joining me now at the Australian Music Vault is one of Australia's most celebrated artists of all time, Ms. Kate Sobrano. Welcome. Mm -hmm. I was actually watching someone um, in a movie yesterday receiving their opening and sitting and grimacing as the person was saying, ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the stage, uh, blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. And I actually do think that's probably the thing I least like is the announcement before entering stage. You grimace? Yeah, I do. A part of me feels like it gives me too much to live up to. In, in as much as how much time I've spent doing what I do. It is a shopping list, Kate. It is, but it shouldn't be one that's, that's like, dealt with very literally because unlike any other industry in arts, one would expect to have a bit of a run-up at what we do, right? But we don't. Mm. So you sort of got to bluff and make it up as you go along and you're going to do some shit stuff and you're going to do some excellent stuff and you're going to make some, especially in this country, in an effort to just stay working, you're inevitably going to do some tragic things that have nothing to do with music. And so when they list them all as these lauded events, you're like, <laughs> yeah, no, please no, 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 please no. But, Kate, you say shit and tragic, but to the outsider, it's very few and far between in your career. If you last more than a decade, say you last three or four, um, there are things that you do have choices about, like do you do television, for instance? Do you, do you perpetuate your career in other ways that um, might give you income but don't give you that sense of integrity, you know? So when I say shit stuff, it's probably stuff that's just like, oh, you know, it'll be... There was some TV stuff I loved, like I loved Dancing with the Stars. Mm -hmm. I didn't love It Takes Two. Aha, uh -huh, right. There's a painting of a 17-year-old you in your home in Melbourne painted by Peter Robinson. Mm -hmm. Melbourne painter. Yes. Um, I suppose in a sense it's reminding you of how far you've come in your career in a sense. True? Yeah, well, actually the painting sat after Gypsy kind of got into like kindergarten space. Um, <laughs> we, it, we had it actually on show. It's, it's, it's a nude. It's a beautiful standing nude and highly realistic. And, um, and she came home one day and, you know, the minge is at about the five-year-old or maybe eight-year-old sort of nose level <laughs> in, in the hallway. And she said, Mum, I'm good with this, but I don't know if my friends want to see you walking around naked. <laughs> so I sort of went, okay. So we put the said nude into a, um, into a storage unit and, and kind of like Oscar Wilde's Dorian Gray, it, it lay with its, its breast to the wall. And, and in some ways I sort of feel like I've kind of burdened that naked me, that young teenage me with all the things, all the things I haven't wanted to see and do. I was sort of thinking that if I turned it around she would have grown, you know, some chin hair and, <laughs> and, and lost about three inches in, in elasticity, which is it, it's kind of more how it is these days. Mm. Um, and that painting, and it is a reminder of maybe um, definitely the skin I was in. And there's been a lot of the bonfire, the vanities to get rid of that skin and and not wish to be still in that skin, mm. but instead kind of own the skin I'm in now. Mm. It's a big deal. Are you having these conversations with other singers? I, I'm finding, do they describe this feeling about their self-consciousness or Everyone body? Everyone has a different story. Right. I'm curious as to what 17-year-old Kate Sobrano was like. Um, I would like to say that I was like, f for my feeling of watching Judy Davis when she was in my brilliant career, that, that title has nothing to do with what I'm about to say, by the way, because that sounded a bit like <laughs> my brilliant career, um, <laughs> in that she was fearless and she dominated the spaces she was in as a, as a kind of go-to out of social anxiety. And I did that. I definitely did that. And I was not ashamed to say that the, the way I compensated was overcompensate for what I felt I didn't have. I was racing around with people 10 and 15 years older than me. And a lot of them had already had degrees in literature and art and you know, they weren't, they weren't dumb bums. I mean, I'm talking, for instance, they, all of them were all graduates in some degree of arts and I was a school dropout. So I had a lot to prove. And the way I compensated was with, um, with emotional energy. Like I could get on a stage and I was fearless of the stage. 
and I could lay on the ground, I could tear my clothes off, I could cry, I could laugh, I could sing, I could dance and there was nothing that could stop me. So there was definitely nothing wrong with what I was trying to do at that time. Um, I like 17-year-old self. In <laughs> fact, I like myself even early in that because I was younger when I started. Mm. I was mostly 14, 14, 15 I was in and on the stages. What I didn't love was having sort of that um, collision with, with real love and seeing myself through the eyes of someone else and then being really critical of me. Like I fell in love with someone who didn't love me as much as I loved myself, let's put it that way. Okay. <laughs> it's a okay. terrible thing to say. Was that your first heartbreak? Yes. And it was, it was, a, it was a killer. It was a killer. How? It, um, it served to, it was great as a songwriter, but I'd never been self-conscious until my heart was broken. Oh. It was really, it was, it was a real, I mean, I was sort of like, like I said, I was like that kind of character in a film that seemed to have been oblivious to, um, I didn't have shame, I didn't have, I was the original Eve. And then this guy kind of intoxicated me with this feeling of like I wouldn't be the same if I didn't have the other half of me, you know, which is, I don't know, it was really strange. Mm -hmm. Made for some great material for songwriting. Well, let's talk about the songwriting. (laughs) Okay. I'm going to I'm going to go all places here just because I think at 23 you write and release the song that I think has possibly become the mantra of your entire career. Yeah. Brave. Yeah. I will never walk away, just be brave and stay, hold me till the end and in your arms I'll rise up high. Um, I still get quite teary when I hear it, especially oh. the Melbourne Symphony Orchestra version oh my that God. you recently re-recorded or I know. recorded, There's released. something painfully true about that that the the musical arrangement of that um I am so um how do I describe it well first of all let's just talk about Roscoe James Irwin for a second so that's that's the most current arrangement you're talking about correct so Roscoe works with the Bamboos and Cat Empire and, and, and he's in the field of dreams. Like he, he basically offers without um, interface, he's like this incredible genius who says, what do you want for lunch? I said I'd, I'd like to have, um, you know, love actually for lunch. <laughs> I would like to have Joni Mitchell's both sides now for afternoon tea and I'd like to be Shirley MacLaine in Sweet Charity for a late night supper somewhere preferably romantic, you know. And he says, yeah, no worries. And out comes the quill and there he goes. And then like this beautiful, he delivered me a sonic landscape and the song became probably what I always hoped I could live into. The time that I wrote the song, it seemed a bit glib because I was sort of merely responding to um, a criticism that I'd had by an a and guy in the studio and he was like um, a very famous a and guy who'd actually he'd actually discovered the Rolling Stones in, in, in London. So he, he was very important and he'd been brought in by the label to help me shape an album and, and he, was, he was confused. He didn't understand with the material I was, I was, I, I was confused. I was, I was confused. You, know, you I was were young. A, a fart in a bottle. I mm. didn't know anything about anything. And he was scratching his ass and was going, you know, oh, this is like, it's just like, it's just, it's just like, I don't understand. It's not the way we make hit records. It's what he'd say, he'd say it over and over. This is not the way we make I'm like, oh, what the fuck would I know about making a hit record? I'm like seven, you know, 18, whatever I was. So um, I just left him in there discussing hit records and I went into a room like this, which was an ante room that was where a piano was seated just there and I went through the only three chords I I knew and and sort of half pilfered off Kate Bush's Man with the Child in His Eyes and I wrote that song and I guess I was sort of half whispering to myself hang in there just just be brave because you're here Mm. so you may as well start something Mm. and then my brother Phil came in my brother Phil's always been there at that at that very critical place when I'd lost confidence and he's like come on Kak you know and strumming along there. I mean, honestly, it's a beautiful piece. 
Um, and so now to hear it through, well, a guy that wasn't even born mm. when that was recorded, mm. to have his litera- you know, alliteration of it and it's so remote from me as an experience mm. that I can walk in and feel like I'm inhabiting a place that I was always going to grow up to become and always going to grow up to step into mm. but had to wait 40 years to do it. Wow. Can you imagine? Wow. It's sick. It's the mm. most amazing feeling that when it's happening in on the stage and my daughter's standing next to me and she's singing with me as well, mm. I don't know, it's suddenly I get goosebumps all up and down my, my whole body when I think about it. Wow. It's intense. Oh. <laughs> it's a song about self-belief but of also being loved and supported and you did rise high as you just noted, to where you have this status in Australian music, which you probably maybe loathe as much as you love yeah, uh, because you are considered an icon. You can't talk about Kate Sobrano without the word legend or icon, which <laughs> may be uncomfortable for you, I'm not sure. But it's, funny. it's like you have manifested It's very un-Australian this. to oh, think I know, in because we're not allowed to applaud each other. No, I know. It's sort of sad. What I'm respectfully understanding about myself now is that I'm a hard worker and I love my work and I do feel that that with I set out wishing to be seen as an artist but you can never be seen if that's what you desire unless you actually do and execute mm. the work and that's what I feel I'm doing now mm. and and maybe you know it has taken me a lot longer than most but now I'm sitting here and I feel like my career has only just begun. Wow. What, a, yeah. what an amazing feeling. It's amazing. It's, it's an amazing thing. You came to prominence in the early to mid-80s in I'm Talking, which were tr- trailblazers. I yeah, mean, I agree. really trailblazers in the true sense of the word, where most Australians had been raised on a diet of pub rock and, and beer barn rock. Yeah. And here's I'm talking fronted by yourself mm. and Zan and mm. with these absolute geniuses behind mm. you and Robert Goodge and Ian Cox and Barbara Ian, Hogarth. Absolutely. Yeah. And you were a funk voice amongst the pop and the beer barn rock mm. in Australian music. And mm. again, those songs stand up. They really stand up to this day. Yeah. I, I actually feel like I'm sort of, uh, in a way, I, I never feel equipped for this job, but I feel like I need to, to flag the fact that they're never rated enough for the impact that they made at the time that they made it. It's like we got deferred into some sort of novelty act, it seemed. Really? Novelty? Well, let me put you in the time and place and then maybe it will be self-explanatory. But the Australian scene, as I recall it, like if I were to name a band, like a series of bands that I saw in one month just down at the ballroom and I would have been around 16 or something, I would have gone to see the birthday party and then... Susie Sue would have been in town and they would have had Robert Smith open up with The Cure. New Order had just been in the, the week. Violent Femmes the following week. Um, there were these incredible young punk sort of experimental bands of which I'm talking was one before they, was, before they had singers, they were an instrumental mm, group. Mm. Um, and uh, they were a distinctly art an art-produced band, like all of the philosophy behind them. Again, I don't want to put words into this culture because I sort of end up being the person that talks yeah. about them and I'm sure it must drive them fucking nuts. <laughs> and, but I, I, I can tell you it's with great love mm. and great mm. respect because I joined them as Essen at an airport. Mm. They were an instrumental band. I walked into, I was introduced to them by a very, a very unique artist at the time who I was dating um, he was a bit older than me and I was this sort of this young ingenue, like I said, and introduced to Ian Cox. So Ian says, fantastic, what are you going to do for your audition? I said, um, last night a DJ saved my life. Hit mm. it. Last night a DJ saved my life with a song. And, da, 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 da. and they're like, did it ink, ink, ink. And they're like, oh, yeah. This is going to be great. Put up a first gig in the middle of the city. We did like this great gig. In fact, I'll never forget because one of the original pieces that they'd written was a song called Car Crash, which to my understanding was the first band in Australia to be doing any spoken word. And, you know, we even had like a small um, vinyl which we were scratching on stage. 
and 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 the only thing that to my horror, someone came up and said, "I think you better enunciate that better." And I said, "Why?" Because he said, "When you say um, broken glass, a shattered dream, your head thrust through a window screen, feelings hurt, my love abused, being beaten, battered, bashed, and bruised," and it goes on, right? And the chorus goes, "Your love for me is a car crash." He said, "Sounds a little bit like cock rash." What? <laughs> What? <laughs> I'm like, wow, okay. <laughs> so you see, I was fending off a lot of criticism Ooh. even at that. Oh, crash your car. It's a car. But I was singing. I was trying to emulate American culture. Right. So I'm saying, your love for me is a car crash. Car crash. Yes. <laughs> Sounds very much like that. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> so anyway, um, cut to... The elucidation of Kate Sobrano, which was this tiny, tight team mm. of art students who were musicians who dearly loved American funk and dance music mm. and the real hardcore stuff. Cameo, we did, you know, we loved all of that, Shaka Khan and, and, and mostly Chic. And so by the time Zan came, we were a pretty exciting, double-fronted band, lots of energy, lots of sex appeal, lots of sweat and funk. Barbara Hogarth on the bass was like, to me, she was like a, a Goddard pinup. There was so much to love about I'm so Talking. So much to love about I'm Talking. Yeah, and still, still. And still there is. Yeah. In fact, we went out on tour with Brian Ferry. We opened up for, with Brian Ferry. And uh, I found that was a very, very sexy sort of companion sound. Oh, yeah, yeah. I like that. I like that. Mm-hmm. I know. I loved it. You even got to <coughs> rock the Royals in 1985 right here at Hamer Hall. We did. Fact. We did. We did. As I'm talking, uh, you played with uh, In Excess, The Models and Kids in the Kitchen. Let's just detour because you were singing backup vocals prior to I'm Talking with Models. Is no, that correct? Uh, uh, at the that same Zan? time. At the same time. I, I'm in the band, I'm talking. Yep. And Zan and I are fronting. And James, who, James Freud, wow. James Freud. Ugh. Tell me about James. James was something that only St Kilda or the eastern suburbs, but as we all drifted and we sort of made our, our nest within that precinct, which was the George and the SB and the Palais and, you know, there were all mm. those kind of cultural, they were, they were actually on the forefront, there were more venues which don't exist anymore, no. bananas mm. and other things. Bojangles. And the venue, <laughs> Bojangles. <laughs> I'm digressing because I'm flirting around the fact that I, James James was just everything for me. Like he was our T-Rex. He was our Mark Bolan. He wow. was my, you know, he had that kind of, and and also my David Bowie. Mm. And I had a real, I, I love that androgynous kind of pop, sylph-like, um, sexy singer. Mm. I, I'd hate to kind of, you, you're almost not allowed to say these things anymore. But that was the impact. That's what he was like. He, he yeah. just, he just. He just turned me on. Wow. And um and turned me and 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 turned us into a sound which was to be the sound of summer for that year. Cause Zan and I walked into the sessions and Nick Lornay was producing it. And we were probably gonna do one song and ended up across three others. There was <laughs> Barbados and another one as well, I think. And um did you sing on Out of Mind, Out of Sight as well? We did. Yeah. And and by the time we got to actually shoot the clip, which was just just fantastic. I just, I felt so empowered by that sound. I'm <laughs> just flicking all my hair around and oh. so great. So rocking the Royals, you chose local designer Christopher Graff. In fact, it's here at the Australian Music Vault. The, the yeah, no, it's so strange. It's, the, it's, it's so 80s, isn't it? I know, I know. The it hat is. and the shoulder yeah, pads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What did you say to Prince Charles then, now King Charles? <laughs> I, I said I look like your mother. <laughs> <laughs> I had to have some ostrich feathers because God, you know, I, I've never feared. I've never feared fashion. I loved it. I mean, you know, it's such a drag that um, I don't. I didn't grow up, and I. I don't know. I would love to have been six inches taller and maybe twenty kilos lighter for most of my life, if only to just be able to wear sample sizes of all my mm. best friends' garments, <laughs> because I had some incredible designer friends who just, you know, but they, but for the sheer pu- purpose of showing great designs, often you just need to be sort of long and lean, 
and I would have loved that, but no. Nah. During so, the I'm Talking days, a man by the name of Ken West, God rest his soul, yeah. managed you. Now, Ken West would rise to prominence as the co-founder of The Big Day Out and really make his mark there. Yeah. And Vivian Lee was a big deal with And Vivian as Lee's well. as well. Um, I lived with Ken and his wife in many houses together, share houses together. We were really deep friends. I think you were the one of the first artists he started Man- managing. Yeah. Uh, so take me back to that time. I mean... It was probably his, one of his first gigs. I mean, was that how was that relationship? I loved Ken. Ken was the most optimistic man I've ever known, and and he and Vivian actually were a great sort of like a, um, a dichotomy, in fact, because you know Vivian was sort of pressured and laboured by like all of the minutiae of you know, but yeah, you can't, but yes, you can't, but no, <laughs> no, no, but how could we? And how could we? And Ken was Ken was like a dog that was like you know, perennially happy and the tail is wagging and there was nothing that was ever going to rain on his parade. And <laughs> and and that's why I knew that he was the guy for me because mm. we were always like that. We didn't ever indulge ourselves with how it wouldn't happen. It was only ever how it could happen. And and um, we loved each other. We He loved, he loved what I was doing because I was also into jazz. So and when I say I was into jazz, I was into the cinematic elements of jazz. I was the, the girl that draped herself over a piano. I was scouring op shops for all those incredible garments and, you know, and 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 sewing and hats and and small short gloves. And I mean I, I really saw an era or maybe I just felt like I if I'd been born before I was from somewhere else, you know, mm. I just I just wanted that space. And Ken's wife at the time was very different to me because she was the Anne Margaret kind of version of the 50s. Right. And she had this huge pompadour well before Amy Winehouse. Like, you know, Mandy Mandy was was just, well, she was like Marge Simpson really. <laughs> and she, she kind of lived like that, smoked like that, and talked like that. And, and so the two of them were like my Ma and Pa Kettle. Like I just wow. looked to them for all my leads. Um yeah, and I guess I was just the baby Simpson, you know, <laughs> until I kind of grew up, you know, mm. and, and he was. He was the greatest, greatest company to have as I was, I was being raised as a, as a baby diva. <laughs> <laughs> and then he went on, to, of course, to become impresario to all things great and rock and roll. Changed popular culture yeah. and the way we imbibe live music in this country yes, through the did. big day out. Absolutely. I mean, I mean yeah. The- he and Vivian, well, you know, we needed we needed to find our sort of our we needed to find our identity in that festival culture for Shizzle. Like we mm, needed it. Mm. We hadn't had anything like that. Australian Made was sort of bought for you and through Chris, who was manager of, of Michael Inexcess. and In Excess and and all of all of the rest of the the rock crew. But um, I think Vivian and Ken were always looking to London more than America mm. for uh, we got a lot of American obviously American artists but I felt well they used to bring out Violent Femmes, New Order and all mm. that mob so we were well into that British post-punk sort of thought pattern mm. and and then they brought that to Australia and then it just you know it just well, went speaking of London London's integral to your career for two reasons Number one, you meet Malcolm McLaren when you're a teenager. Yeah. You loved all that Vivian Westwood, the sex shop. You loved Adam and the Ants. I did. Bow, wow, wow. Tell me about meeting someone as incredible as Malcolm McLaren. Well, the call came to to Ken at the time and said we we I I, I would like her to come to London. And so first class. Malcolm McLaren says I want, would like her to come yeah, to London. Yeah, because... I was being feted by a lot of record labels at that age. So 16, 17, you know, Madonna had just hit. And so, I mean, at the start of I'm Talking's career, we had many record labels coming and lawyers yeah. flying in wow. from New York and London to, to sign us up with a view to kind of breaking us internationally, which would have been insane. And they, and they, they very much tried but it was it was quite a task, right? I, and, and I won't even I can't even describe that experience. You might have to get Rob Goodge in here. Um, but it, in amongst somewhere there, Malcolm McLaren was going to make this album, and he was doing it for Madame Butterfly, and and mm. there was this whole kind of classicism. It was before that hooked on classics thing kind of destroyed the concept of his. 
<laughs> or Joe <Hi>. Bunny. <laughs> you, yeah, you got it. But because he had, you know, he was he's the auteur of Buffalo Girls, which mm. is awesome. Mm. So um, I went over there and on meeting him, he was amazing. He loved to tell you stories. He loved to tell you terrible stories about kicking kicking young girls out of cabs and leaving them for dust. And, you know, these are people, he was talking about famous fans and it was a, quite a different era. And I would laugh and, and think, oh, yeah, this is like really rock and roll. Oh, this is amazing. <laughs> um, but then one sad day he sort of turned to me and he said, mm mm-hmm. No, I've sort of had you. Um, you know, I, I, I'm digging what you're doing, but it's nothing new to me. Ah. And I, I learnt, and I've, and this is well documented that I've said this, but I learned a really good lesson, is that you you shouldn't go to emulate your heroes so, so, permanently because you don't have a chance of becoming yourself. Mm. And I was a big fan of Anne Lewin and Bow Wow Wow. I'd, I had a Mohican and and um, I'd sing sort of like her and adopt a little bit of a British thing and and he said, yeah, mm, I kind of had you. It's sort of done. You're not original, darling. Yeah, it's not. You should go out and sort of go and find out who you really are. And it's taken 40 years, but you get I there. I suppose that's the greatest advice he could have given you, really. It was really. the greatest advice. He's actually really, he's a very switched on human. There's a lot to be said about a, a person like that. You, you, There's many ways you can observe someone externally and make your judgment based on rumour or other people's opinions, but there was something electric about being around him mm-hmm. and and I felt you probably feel it the same when you're talking to the filmmakers in Melbourne, <laughs> right, through Dogs in Space mm. and a lot of the early filmmakers who were making music videos. Mm. Um, there's a certain power for that, for that person. There's a certain power in knowing that you are on his chessboard, mm-hmm. you are being played within a game to which everyone could win, not everyone will but you're in it. You're mm. in the game. Mm. I loved it. Mm. Second reason London was important to you, there was a possible flirting with Stock Aiken and Waterman. They, you were going to be signed at one point. Didn't happen. What was the whole, I mean, Stock Aiken and Waterman produced <laughs> Kylie, Jason Donovan, Mel and Kim, uh, Dead or Alive. Yeah, that's true. I... Yeah, I have to read Mark Seymour's book about Melbourne, I think, around that time. I mean, he describes the climate as very aggressive politically within the sense of how you saw yourself in music. Within the music industry? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's quite a socialism. Have you ever read his book? I've, I read it years ago. Yeah. He, he, he talks about how um, it kind of went foul for them because of things that they themselves, like they were shooting themselves in the foot by insisting that everyone make equal sort of plays, that like no one was greater than the other, okay. that there was this sort of like it's all of us or no one at all and the rest of the world don't give a fuck about that stuff. They're like, yeah, we're well, great. We'll, yeah. We'd rather take nothing at all then because, yeah. you know, this is going to cost a lot of money and, and like you are <laughs> after all from this really kind of like small place in the middle of nowhere <laughs> and, um, and the Australians are like, yeah, but, you know, we all go together or none of us at all. Right. But it's just not quite like that. Right. Um, in the story of this Stock Aiken Waterman, I was try- I wanted, I, I, with immaturity and with best intentions, I wanted to cut a swath that was different from Kylie's. Ah. Oh. I felt that I, I, I owed it to my community, my self-made original artists of Melbourne. Yeah. Like this is this is the vanity era, right? When, so they offered you a contract, and you were like, "I don't want to be like Kylie." Is that well, what you're not, trying to I say? Well, not I don't want to be like Kylie. I felt at yeah. the time, right or wrong, I didn't want to be written for. Okay, all right. Got I didn't it. want to have my. You didn't want to be manufactured. Well, see now this is no, no we, but that's that's, that's what that, the, that's, that's what Stock Aiken and Waterman represented at manufactured that, at pop that stars time, at that point at yeah. that time yeah. And, you know, respectfully now you look at Kylie, well, her career is her own because she's an individual and she's an incredible artist and, and she's matured within it and she's, she's taken it and poured petrol mm, on what mm. was a very great idea and now it's a bonfire. And some could argue, yeah, well, look at you, you know. you just. But there has to be a point with which you make your choice 
and then you live and die by that sword. Mm, mm. And it seemed that that was the choice that I wanted to make. And I, wonder, I have really no regrets for having done it. I wonder what Kate Sobrano signed to Stockache and Waterman would have sound like. Probably, Probably very like, squeaky pop. Well, I actually think I believe that Mel and Kim were meant to be Zan and I. Is that right? That's just my, okay, I'm just no. putting it out there. Yeah. I mean, PWL were great. So they yeah. were annexed. They were like a sort of a DJ kind of community and they're very, very supportive still to this day actually of some stuff that I was working with and on, and I actually had a top ten hit with Young Boys of My Weakness <laughs> through PWL, <laughs> which was awesome. And um, and now it's kind of gone into that wonderful novelty sense. I'm not going to mm. go to jail for it anymore, which is great. <laughs> I had a few cracks at the apple. Like I went and worked with Frankie Knuckles in New York and, and Arthur Baker. Like I have actually been a bit of a Billy Holiday in my life. I've been in the service entry and out the back of some great, really great communities, mm. great communities of artists. I've, I've actually been recording um, at Psalm Studios where Trevor Horn had just been recording, you know. All, it's where all, they recorded Band-Aid, do they know it's Christmas? You got it. And so... All of my life I've been around the peripherals of greatness and I have actually been able to see and watch the process. And as, as a student in my, in my life, um, I have really loved this long and deep internship I've been having. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Tell me about Michael Hutchins. You write about him in your book. Yeah. There's a great story about him coming to your patio in the hotel room and your mother was freaking out just a little bit? Oh, God, no. She was encouraging me. She's no, she's quite contrary. <laughs> she was shameless. <laughs> oh, so she wanted you to oh, yeah, 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 no, no, no. I mean, my mother, very young mother, and, and a manager, actually, one of the first women in management in this country, she got my album to triple platinum. And she, in fact, she got Nick Launay. Um, one of the most lauded producers to work on that. She was she she had quite a lot of goals. She just more front than Myers. We will talk about Cherie Sobrano. Oh God, okay. one of the tra- again a trailblazer. Uh, but Michael, Michael Hutchins. So Michael, in this instance, and from what I remember, and I could be making up a lot of it, but I don't think I am. I'll let you make up the difference. You, you can decide what's true and false. The Cosmopolitan Hotel was awesome. So it used to sit. In a in a sort of cul-de-sac on Bondi Junction, which Bondi was back in the day, a very Ackland Street sort of operation. It had very dark Eastern European cafes, which had you know those wonderful early um, immigrants came and and they they found their real estate there and from Eastern Europe, and they established all the great coffee houses. It was so it was so such an antithesis to the Bondi blue sky, mm. you know, beach bodies. This was like a row of like Europas and in it was the cosmopolitan. It was cockroach ridden. It was, you know, <laughs> clad in that. <laughs> Interiors were all clad with those um, fantastic old fibre woods and anyway. All I can tell you is the whole thing leaked. All the windows banged in the wind on the ocean front. And they put us all there after the Aras and the bands would just go crazy. Because, <laughs> you know, there wasn't anything. It was indestructible. You could throw things at it. You could throw things off of it. You could throw things in it. And it would seemingly make no difference and no one was charged for it. And that was the end of the story. The rumour has it mm-hmm. that he scaled the front of the Cosmopolitan, found my balcony and fell asleep. And I woke up in the morning and my mother came into my room. She said, my conscience is asleep on your balcony. No. And I said, well, what, what should I do? She said, you should let him in. <laughs> I said, really? Can I? It was like I was asking her permission. <laughs> really? Really? The, the king of pop and the queen of pop? Oh, it's just too salacious for words. And, uh, and I was just too young and too nervous. I wouldn't have known what to do. So I did invite him in and then we had breakfast and it was nothing major. He just loved kind gestures and he loved being safe when he was probably in unsafe territory and which could, you know, you're looking at sort of like the history of stars, aren't you really, Mm. which they're kind Mm. of hounded Mm. by their own success. I've never rated myself as one of those. I don't have to escape from young women who want to tear clothing off me Mm. or 
who want to stalk me and read my mail or or mm. take my underwear from you know uh, places and 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 keep them close to their bodies and there's some really odd things that happen in that space and it seems that there is something to do with like I've talked to Daryl Braithwaite about this I've talked to well James Rain the horror of being mm. inundated I saw Keanu Reeves one time we were in a in a space a public space and someone accosted him and just kind of mouth raped him and he was just like mm. eh, eh, ugh, you know and mm. and it was like it wasn't it wasn't invited and it wasn't enjoyed and and it left you know it, it can leave an indelible mark mm. on it makes you question if i'm to be in his space it makes you question if they wanted it at all, mm. I know he wanted to live and make music mm. and be an artist because he was such a poetic person. Mm. He had so much to offer. Um, but there's a point where people stop listening, don't they? They just want to watch. Mm. Especially if it's tabloid and dirty and gritty. Yeah. And splashed everywhere. You mentioned your mother, Cherie Sobrano, one of the first female managers in this country. Yeah. How and why did your mum decide to manage you? Was it was it was it a means to an end? Because I mean, you were you were looked after by oh. Ken in the I'm Talking days. So at what point does your mum say I'm stepping in here? I'm going to handle this. Oh no, no, she never did. I roped her in. I think I got I got heartbroken and lost confidence. And then I think I think I speak for myself when I say this. I think we all race home after first hurt. Oh. And I remember going home just before we started working together because I wouldn't have actually have naturally chosen my mum in that space. My mum's only 20 years older than me because she'd had four of us before she was 21 actually. She was a young, young mum. I had maths make sense. She was 20, 21 years <laughs> older. Um, so she was quite youthful and she was up for the game. As it turns out, I kind of... Um, I. I I enjoyed it and I didn't enjoy it. Like I felt that on the one hand I, I wanted comfort, I needed the sort of experience that I felt she had. I wanted her um, confidence because she was very, very confident. But um, I think I also wanted to go back to the wildness and the privacy of my life. See, I moved out at home at 16. Mm. I was living on my own in an apartment um, even before I could drive. Is this in your expose or hoagie cats days? Hoagie cats. Hoagie cats. So I had had a taste of freedom, like yeah. quite a lot of it. <laughs> and uh, as I said, heartache will really, heartache will challenge wow. the first massive one. It stopped me. I, I, I hadn't been stopped up until then. Wow. With, with brothers, older brothers, I was actually fearless. And I think maybe I, I want to say I was a little bit sort of like without fear and it was dangerously without fear. And then I just charged into some situation, came away like, what the fuck just happened? And then went home. I was like, mum, help me. And we started working together. She was very, very good at her job. And um, she did super, super, super well. And then I fell in love again. And then we started working together and it became a whole different scene. And she said, look, you just get amongst it and get into your life now. They say success is the best revenge. Was the first heartbreak guy able to, you know, were you able to go, suck shit? Well, my songs, you know, you hope that certain songs are more famous because then they're going to be like that kind of resounding, <laughs> yes, in my dust, motherfucker. <laughs> but uh, you, can't always, you can't always guess which songs are going to be most famous. Right. Like Brave is very lovely and it's kind of coming from a good place. But I wanted that real one. I wanted the one that said, <laughs> I'm going to be better off without you. My life is better and I hope you win. It's not going to happen that way. But then there was succession of, of heartaches actually right. which only served to give you, they just give you a whole different sense of yourself. Your recovery tells you more about who you are, I think, mm. than anything else. Mm. And I do have the power to recover. It's not what happens to you, it's how you handle it, how you recover, how you bounce back. In the end it is. Actually my husband and I, we get along really well. We've been together for a couple of decades now and the reason why we get along so well is we are so very universal and independent from each other that we can we we can collide and have a mutual 
agreement about something, but we can also be very, very at, at opposite ends and still be in harmony with each other. And that's, you don't have that often with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. In the 90s, you star in a movie, well, Cammy, a, sm- a small movie made by your husband Lee called Dust Off the Wings. Yes. <laughs> Tell us about this piece of cinema. Cinema gold. Ah. Well, it, it got it got five stars by David Stratton. I think he called me a force of nature, which was really good. You were and very good in it. It stars your brother Phil as well. Yes, Phil. And we, and all of the culture of Bondi, that surf culture is pretty disgusting. That I mean the bra boys and other things. Mm, mm. That, you know, whichever which way you swing it, anything that involves so much freedom mm. and then so is is and is so toxic because of the CBD element because it's so close to town and mm. so close to the subculture of it all but it actually is a common thing um well it was at that age when we were getting married where people still had major considerations about fidelity and mm. and they'd be going and getting married for all of the middle class hoop they are but with their fingers crossed behind their backs mm. knowing full well that at some point in the future they'd be faithless mm. and that's what he was examining and and it was and it was it was an ugly portrait of an ugly culture but it's still an epic film and the, and the sad thing about it um, well, not the sad thing about it is that it's taken 18 years, but we finally showed our daughter. <laughs> um, <laughs> and we sat there the other day and it was like this sort of like this, <laughs> you've got like, you know, all the mates sitting on the couch. They're like, ooh, oh, ooh. And of course it's, it's quite benign to them now. Yeah, yeah. Like we've hidden it almost like, as I said, this hidden un- unexposed sort of part of our early culture and she's like, oh, that's really funny. It's really funny. It could do with a bit of editing. <laughs> <laughs> it's gross and it's great. But Something that wasn't gross, however, on film, you actually got to act alongside David Wenham. Oh, yes. Great David Wenham mm. in a beautiful story, yeah. film, classic called uh, Molokai, the story of Father Damien. Right. You get to sing in it as well. Um, yeah. How did that come about? It. I mean, you're not in it for long, but it's a beautiful, like you look incredible. Uh, where was it shot, first off? Well, first of all, I'll put you into context for Melbourne filmmaking, Australian mm. filmmaking. Mm. Paul Cox, a very famed Dutch filmmaker, um, comes to Australia and, and he and he and his cinematographer make some pretty stunning movies. Paul Grabowski does all the soundtracks for his movies. They're kind of like a community. Right. And uh, Paul and I had worked together on doing some soundtracks for some other films and it just so happened that they were making a movie about Hawaii. Now my father's from Hawaii. Mm-hmm. I had been there and had a lot of indoctrination of the early culture and the politics of the Hawaiian culture. Um, I play the the last reigning queen of Hawaii, the true queen. Her Mm. name was Lili Okulani. And she very sadly had her country annexed from her to become a 50th state of America. So she was put into her palace for the rest of her life at the age of 30 and sort of was imprisoned within her palace actually for no reason other than that they had made a decision that it was going to be a 50th state and it was crazy. So her campaign, and this is why the singing and me made sense, Mm. her campaign and the only way she could um, offer her uh, people a sense of independence was she would write songs for them. Wow. And send songs out to them from Mm. the palace. Mm. And she wrote... A song, Aloha Oi, which is in featured in the film. Cut to Paul calls me and says, would you like to do this movie? I said, does a cat have a bum? <laughs> Absolutely, I would love to do that movie. Um, I, do I need to come and audition? And I did. And uh, and Paul, working with Paul Cox was really, you know, it was like working with Ingmar Bergman or some one of the, some, someone who was very important. And then he added David Wenham, mm. remarkable actor. So Derek Jacobi was in it. Chris Christopherson was mm. there. He was in it. Um, I mean, there's a list, there's a cast of many. Mm. And the most profound thing that I had to do was I had to audition for the Hawaiians 
for them to accept me as their queen. Wow. So I flew into this small island and for those of you who don't know the movie, it was about a leper colony that had been bounty hunted and placed to die on a very remote spit of an island called Molokai. They put me all in gear and I'm wearing garments, 100-year-old garments or more, and then I came out into a small tent and there's probably about, I want to say 80 of the cast members who are some of the heaviest musicians in Hawaii. They come from families, Casimero Brothers, there's this other group of other artists, there's some some of Hawaiian um, actors and they're sitting here like this and and I had to sing for them. So I, I've just got off a plane, I'm in this <laughs> garment. I'm like, I, and and I gave them my heart and soul and really, at the end, they just went, yeah, okay. And then we shot the scene. And I had to go straight from there, straight onto the balcony and deliver that piece I told you that Lily Okalani wrote for her people, which was in Hawaii and I had to sing Aloha Oi. So needless to say, I was pretty undone and I'm not an actor and I, I wouldn't have been able to have faked it if I, I didn't feel it because I just didn't, I don't have that technique, I don't have any of that training so I was in it and I did feel it. It was powerful. Mm, it's a powerful scene, Oof, really powerful. It's full on. I loved it. I would act again. <laughs> well, you're playing the uh, virtuous virgin Mary Magdalene. Oh, no, no, she was no virgin. Oh, I'm sorry. No, two things sorry. that people misunderstand about the... Uh, but the she rock. was a virgin when she had Jesus, we're supposed to no, believe. No, I wasn't Jesus' mother. You I, weren't Jesus' no, no, mother? No, no, Okay. And I love clarifying this for people. Okay, thanks. Clarify because, it for me. Well, and even because sometimes some religious people um, are confused okay. when they consider that... So there's Mary so, and there's Mary Magdalene. Okay, Mary right? Magdalene was a prostitute. Okay. Good. I had that okay. down. I'd, so... So I had that, no worries. That's method acting. Right. I, I didn't have to be concerned. I you know, it's like <laughs> this is before both. Um and so so the the problem and this was Tim Rice. Okay, so Tim okay. Rice. Let's let's just give Tim Rice a Guernsey. Sure, sure. Because he comes from the school um of those really clever um academics of which John Cleese and all the Monty, Monty Python. Very clever. You know, they they, they all came out of those colleges where they'd sit around and they would just chew on the bone of contemporary culture, mm. including religion, philosophy and other things. Tim Rice did something sort of like uncharacteristically sober and he wrote a version of the Bible but he made Jesus human mm. with foibles. Mm. And made him question why was he put in that position under such an enormous amount to, 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 anyway. And then if you, so I'm, I don't want to read too much because we all know it's just a rock and roll concert, mm. but it, its premise is geared in such a, an endemic way into the, the psyche of, of cultures and how they, you know. But it is actually a very, it's a very, very common story that you have someone who has a certain charismatic charm and can influence others by the sheer force of his enthusiasm or optimism. He's loved by someone who just simply wants to care for him and keep him safe, which happens to be a prostitute. His best friend is a person who wishes him to not sacrifice himself in this way and make these large claims, which he can't actually prove. So you've got this classic story, it's a contemporary story of which we have today, mm. where people are wanting proof mm. and others simply want faith and stuck in between somewhere is this happy little prostitute, which happens to be me, who's saying, steady on you two, there's a way we can work this out. And, and this, was the, this was his proposition. So um, I, I saw the play. I saw Marsha Hines playing Mary Magdalene. Uh -huh. uh, I saw um, the film and I saw a beautiful Hawaiian singer, Yvonne Elliman. And do you know the thing that I saw that was common amongst us all? We were all of colour. We were all of multi-race, of multi-faith. We were, in fact, what I consider to be the face of the international person today. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I suppose we were 
the bridge over troubled water. Mm. And that's what Mary was for me. I loved the play. I loved the play. I loved the questions. I loved that the questions were never answered. And I loved the war between um, good and evil, if you will. Mm. And they were played really well by John Farnham and John Stevens. John Farnham and John Stevens. I mean, uh, does it get better than that? I mean, <sighs> it's like an, it's like the white wolf and the Alsatian going at each other. It was honestly, and John Farnham, like, you just have to go back. I just posted a picture actually of a picture I had just found. It was a dress rehearsal. And John would sing and look into my face each and every night for over 100 shows with such sincerity that it was disarming. Wow. Because I believe he loved me every night. Wow. He just gave me so much gravitas as a human. And, and, and I'd reach out for him, you know, and I'd touch him and he'd, you know, oh, God, just the thought of it, just. And, you know, we're looking at a man now who's lived the greater part of his life pretending to be happier than he was because he had some inordinate mm. obstacles to have to go for, to overcome mm. um, and that shining face and great expectation. And so I just wish him peace and comfort now. Mm. I hope he's happy and comfortable. Mm. He just, no one needs him to be anything anymore. I just love him so much. <laughs> <laughs> You've performed with other greats. Uh, <clears throat> there's... Frank Sinatra at yeah. Sanctuary Cove. There's Whitney Houston, Peter Allen. Peter Allen was a boss. Tell me about Peter Allen. Peter Allen, honestly, he shared his piano still. My brother and I oh. were just sitting on either side. He and Alice Cooper. What? Two very similar humans. You're telling me they're similar? Yeah. I tell you, they are. They are the same person. How? How? <laughs> <laughs> because I can tell, and this is just my theory, yeah. okay? I don't reckon either of them thought of themselves as being particularly attractive men. Right. And so they were singing for a sort of like a, a sort of like a subculture of someone who often came from their rooms, quite introverted, but loved music and wanted to sing and found themselves on the stage irresistibly performing this person that they had created, <laughs> right? I just, I totally feel like Peter Allen had a mask and Alice well, has had course. one as well. Yeah. And the two of them, you couldn't find more lovelier humans if you tried. Like, I have no words. Peter Allen sat there and he said, hi, and what's your name? He says to Phil. You're gorgeous and this is your gorgeous, is this your sister? Oh, gorgeous. And <laughs> the two of us would sit there. I was on the seat and, and, and Phil overhang and he's sitting there and, and he was talking us through tenor, tenor field salad. He's telling us as if he was telling, you know, it was as quiet and as, and as intimate as if there were like, you know, several thousand people that he was going to tell the story to later that night. And Alice was exactly the same. Mm. Met in a plane. Phil and I happened to be there together again. We were in economy. He was in business. We both kind of accosted him over the way and said, oh, Mr Cooper, Mr Cooper, we're so, so great. And he goes, he turned around and he goes, Kate, you know, it's amazing. I was just talking about you on radio this Stop morning. Stop it. No. Phil said that. He's like, what? what? You were talking about my sister? What do you mean you were talking about her? And he said, no, he said, yeah, he said, exactly. I was saying if there was ever a singer that should take on Janice Ian's whole repertoire, it's Kate Sobrano. And I'm like, Shh, shit, well, if it's the last thing I do in my lifetime is I do a retrospective on Janice Ian. You have That's, to now, uh, well, surely. Well, Alice, it's been told. It's happened. It's just now I just have to park my bark <laughs> somewhere in there and just get on the mic and just fucking do it. Oh, my Alice God. has said so that... because Alice told me to. I... Um, you don't need any other reason. Listen, what with Peter on one end of me, Alice on the other end of me, I'm, I'm having the time of my life. With Whitney? <laughs> I didn't get to meet Whitney. I, 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 as much as I would have loved to have met Whitney, there was so much I would have done. I would have held her mm. if I'd met her. Mm. I would have held her and told her how, how amazing she is and was and I'm sad that she didn't. It's like there have been some people who've passed in ways that were inglorious. Mm. It's an inglorious way to go. Yeah. 
Um, what about the World Music Awards with Prince Sting and Grace Jones? Did okay. you highlight of my life? Really? There was an ad for Christian Dior's um, what's the perfume that smells like roses? Can't remember. Whatever it was. You weren't born actually. <laughs> um, but what it was, the opening sequence was this a bit like a Wes Montgomery film where it's on the Cote d'Azur and it's a large um, hotel with all the balconies and at different t- opportunity models open, they up, open up the yeah, balcony. Yeah, I think okay. I have seen it, yeah. We stayed there after arriving after 40 hours of cattle class and I was travelling with my mum so it was a great excitement. That was 19 <laughs> or something. And we had the two double beds in a room and I wake up and I'm like, Mom, we're in that ad. <laughs> I know. I open up the balcony and it's the Cote d'Azur in front of us and then the two of us are just like jumping from one bed to the other oh bed like this. God. And, you know, la, 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 singing French songs. And, and then I had to kind of, you know, pull it back a bit and get to sound check and we walked downstairs. So you performed at the World Musical? I did. What did you perform? What Bedroom did you Eyes. Oh. It was the highest selling single of its year and, and, and every country at that stage apparently Albert Big fan of music. Every continent. Prince would, Albert. That's correct. Oh, my goodness. Whoever was nominated of having the highest selling single of that year were were brought to Monaco for the World Music Awards. Um, we had parties. Bob Geldof I met years later again and we and he remembered it. Those guys were very, very uh, commonplace for them to have this continental experience. And I'm that great witness because I'm the one that, oh, what does that do? Oh, can I taste that? Oh, my God, I'm never going to, oh, pinch me, I'll never forget it. I don't, I have no shame. So I'm, you know. And the only thing I regret actually in my life is never having gotten Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel's signatures because I was too shy and didn't want to invade their privacy. It wasn't like me. It was very (laughs) weird. I regret it so much. Big regret. Wow. Bedroom Eyes. Thank you, Bedroom Eyes. Yes, indeed. What does that song mean to you now? It means that my mother was right. Right. She picked it as a hit? She did. Out of, you know, we'd get like thousands of cassettes of from all publishers from all over the world and she pulls this one out and it's just got this certain something. Wow. And um, I had done something wrong about the month before or several months um, before. I had declined a meeting with a lovely young filmmaker who was making a movie about ballroom dancing. And Strictly he was ballroom? asking me to sing, indeed. So that was like, gung gang. So I had to take up this offer of what was bedroom eyes in it. And she was right. She was right on both scores. She's right about a lot of things. And this particular, this track written by Raymond Jones, who then went on to become the music supervisor for Spike, Spike Lee and works with him. Uh, it was great provenance and it, it's held stead with me. It's a great track and it's actually, I reckon it's still super contemporary. Like I would mm, dearly mm, love to do mm. like some mega fat reggae mix wow. of that. But that may have to go into my French pop Euro I'm kind liking of this. electro. I, I'm I actually this. am too. Yeah. I'm liking it. Feeling it. Yeah. I feel like Bedroom Eyes could take me back. Oh, you could sing some in French too. Le yerk de, whatever bedroom is, le camera de. Yeah, what is it? it is. Boudoir. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I suppose. Le oh, boudoir. <laughs> your entire body of work, I mean, you're about to release your 30th album, which just floored me. I can't believe it's 30, your 30 albums in in this career. They all must seem like children to you, right? I don't listen to them and I don't tend to sort of mark them up on a wall of how many are done and when and how. Oh, but your fans do. Mm, they do, <laughs> and of which I'm actually, I'm, I'm, I'm super actually grateful for that. They definitely are a witness to um, my shenanigans. But um, of the one that I'm really, really relaxing into mm. is this symphony mm. because it's not, I just don't think anyone understands how fortunate you are to have a symphony orchestra. I mean, we see, we feel, I feel like we're seeing it more and more these days where emerging artists will get an opportunity. Yeah. But we wouldn't have had a hope in hell of having had a symphony. We had electro strings for all of my career mostly. Occasionally a small, you know, like chamber orchestra or I've done pops orchestras before, but to have a full symphony, the MSO sound absolutely stunning on this record. 
It's, it's more. It's more than I can have wished for. But the wonderful thing about you is your versatility. You can do jazz. You can do the pop. You can do the orchestrated. When did you know? When did you discover this voice in you that that has that has led you to this incredible career? Um, I can mark off several singers that I dis, I just think the world needed more of. Petula Clark, Scylla Black, Dion Warwick, Dusty Springfield, Ella Fitzgerald, mm. and Nina Simone, Billie Holiday. These are big singers mm. and they're very expressive singers. Mm. Julie London, Peggy Lee, and um, they always say I sound like this one, but I can't think of your name. Anyway. There's a, if I were to tell you what I thought was similar about mm. the, all of them mm. is that they have a very broad spectrum in them. Mm. Yeah. And as humans, mm. they're very broad spectrum. Mm. And so I don't think that there are many big, oh, and, and, and um, Shelley Bassey. Mm. But then I'd even go out on a limb and also say Nana Muscuri. <laughs> so these artists don't exist anymore. No, they don't. And I don't think the music industry can produce artists like this anymore. No. Potentially. No, no. Adele mm. is the closest thing we have mm. and Lady Gaga, fabulous, because they are self-owned women who are writing their own story and writing their own material. Up until this record, I'm not going to say that I felt contained within the recording process, but I have because I've got a voice that apparently has given a lot of people a lot of trouble to record. A lot of trouble? Well, yeah, because it peaks and it's it's too quiet and then, and then it's too deep and then it's too brown and then it's too blue and then it's too purple and pink. And what happens is I have to, I feel, this is what I've done in an order to sort of like make it easier for others, I've, I've contained certain parts of the spectrum. Oh. So having a symphony so you've orchestra. you compromised. Uh, yeah. A little. Uh, yeah. Mm. Like, like as if, it, like now, for instance, if you were pegged to a, a, a body mic yeah. and you were sitting in a weird way and some part of your fabric yeah. was rubbing, yeah. well, you'd sit stock still, wouldn't yeah. you? Yeah, of course. Well, that's how I feel I've sung. Wow. For a very, very long time. Oh. I don't, I've never understood the recording process. I've never loved studios. I've never loved doing that. Well, the symphony orchestra, because of the volume and the range of spectrum, oh, I have just let it rip. Yeah. And now I feel like I'm actually singing for the first time. Wow. I know. I feel like I'm singing from my soul. Oh. It's not just something, just not some sort of like thinking anymore. It's just pure feeling. And and I know it feels like that when a person plays in an orchestra. I don't think you can get into an orchestra unless you can actually expose your heart in that way and I, they even do it behind screens mm. when they when they audition people they don't see them they don't look at them they put them behind a screen and they have a multitude of different people come along and they have to play the same piece wow. and the the viewer the listener will will choose the one that has the broadest spectrum and moved them on an emotional level the most and that's the person who gets a gig Goodness me. I Did you no know idea. that? I had no idea. Yeah, I know. It's kind of intense. Maybe we should do that with pop stars. <laughs> we kind of do it on The Masked Singer, don't we? Well, they? we do, don't we? We do. And The Voice. Yeah, we do too. Mm. We, well, yeah, to a greater or lesser degree we do, yes. Yeah. yeah. Kate Sobrano, when I think <clears> of you, the words indefatigable and tireless spring to mind. Oh, I love those words. They're my favourite. I use them a lot. You seem to have this optimism and positivity and joy, it's almost like an ever-ready battery. <laughs> it really is because it's, it's I good. don't think I've ever seen you on an off day. I'm sure you have them but I've never seen them or, you know, the industry sees you as just this wonderful, radiant, positive being. Where does that come from and how has it lasted so long? Oh, well, look, first of all, I have to tell you, you can't have light without dark. Of course. That's so there's definitely darkness and there's definitely, um, you know, um, volatility that in order to get things a certain way, I do love an orderly life. Right. And I have studied many different ways in my life and I'll 
I'll employ anyone's method if it works. Right. I really will. In fact, I was reading Brian Eno today. Uh huh. And he's a very um, computer literate guy. Right. Who has converted the sound of soul to a binary computation. You're either on or you're off, aren't you? Yeah. That's true. what it is kind of the concept. Yeah. Okay. So all I'm saying is I will say that. When I need to be on, yep. then I better be fucking educated in what I, I'm going to need uh-huh. when I'm on to sustain right. it yep. because it's not good enough to employ people, to invest in yourself or, or others or even take people on an experience, an audience, if you don't have the tools that are going to sustain you when you're in it. Mm-hmm. If you have a dream, it's one thing. It's like talent. It's wonderful. Mm. Have the dream. But own the space you're in with intelligence and education and use everything you can find and educate yourself on it. For instance, I will study many things. I will read many books to understand human nature. But in the end, it's just, are you on or are you off? That's what it is for me. If your life was a movie, who would you get to play you? Definitely Penelope Cruz. (laughs) Just because I just want anything to do with her. She's so yummy. (laughs) First concert you went to? James Freud at the Blue Light Disco. Was that during his teenage radio star yes, years? Yes, it was. Modern girl? Yes. Oh. So you see, my love started, I was a heavy, heavy, hectic fan. I stood there, actually, I think I was catatonic with, with love, joy, about literally about two feet away from his beautiful face. Oh. I see, ah, ah, fell in love you know, oh, it's still a brilliant song to this day. Oh, I agree. Yeah. Oh. How did you hear about his passing? I think it might have been his family oh. who contacted me. Oh. Um, I couldn't believe actually how well the family had been mm. prepped mm. by him, mm. you know. He is a rock and roll suicide, rather mm. die young than die ugly, mm. die old, you know, mm. something. But that family are very stoic. Mm. They are amazing. Mm, bless. Yeah. What's your favourite word? It's a phrase actually. Can that count? Yeah. I have a little bit of good news. That's the phrase. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of good news. Oh. Yeah. What was the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Actually, the best advice I was ever given was actually, at the time it was a bit sharp. It was Vince Jones. He said, you will never amount to anything, Kate Sobrano, because you lack discipline. And he said it after I (laughs) fell off a piano, um, (laughs) after really lovingly fell off a piano after a few drinks and I was singing rather vigorously and and laughed and rolled off a piano and I was having the best time of my life but I was only about 16 and I guess I could feel what he was saying was that I I actually honour something within you but you're not going to make it. Wow. And actually I just I just programmed him for his show at the Cabaret Festival this week and met and saw him backstage and this is the first time I've seen him in 40 years, virtually. But I still rate him as one of the greatest singers in Australia as a jazz artist and a trumpeter. Yeah. And and I I looked, I've looked at him looking at me mm-hmm. and and I felt that it was almost like a kind of like a, a dare. And it was done. Wow. I reckon he laid the gauntlet down. He's like goodness. Yeah. What's the biggest misconception about you? Probably that I'm always happy. When I say that, I mean I am warm. Mm, Very. And I am familiar. Mm. I'm really approachable. Mm. But what I mean to say is that there's a sort of like uh, there's nothing glib about, I would like to think so anyway, about my happiness. Like I I don't aspire to being a person who's in a, a state of happiness all the yeah, time. Right. Mm. I think that that's unsustainable and it's actually it's disingenuous to the act of being an artist. You should 
you should try to, uh, I don't know, at least discover the spectrum of your human emotions and be them when you are them. I've done a lot of camouflaging that as a child and I did a lot of overcompensating and trying to say, look over here, look over here instead of looking over here. Mm. So that's, I guess that's what I'm sort of, uh, that that part. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? <sighs> Turn around and do that all again. <laughs> but this time, do it right. <laughs> How would you like to be remembered, Kate Sobrano? As a doer. Doer. Well, let's go back to that Peter Robinson painting of you as a 17-year-old. Yeah. What would you like to say to that, Kate, who is just discovering the world as you sit here today? I think I think what I would have said to her is that you should stay being a life model, you should stay owning your skin and you should stay loving the skin you're in and expose it to the light as often as you can and what you cover will grow and what you feel shame for is bullshit, is absolute bullshit. Just sing your song and sing it loudly and, you know, relax. I think that's a great place to end it. It's been <laughs> wonderful being in your company. Kate Sobrano, thanks so much for your time today. Thanks, Annie.